Okay, thank you to everybody that's joining today. Uh, we wanna get started um, on time. We have a lot of information to provide to everyone today on, a, on our topic of transition assessments today. So welcome to our third month of Steps for Successful Secondary Transition Planning. And I wanna let everybody know that the PowerPoint and other handouts are in the, in the pane on your computer. If you click on handouts, you'll see them in there that you can uh, download. And we will also have them posted once this webinar, it is recorded. Once we record it and put it on our website, the handouts would be available on our website as well. If you have any questions throughout the webinar today, please feel free to put that in the question pane. We will try to get to them um, as quickly as possible and be able to hopefully respond to you um, and answer all your questions. And if we can't, we certainly can um, somehow connect later after our presentation today. Okay. Next slide, please. Yep, hang on one second. <laughs> All right, great. Hi, I am Diane Perry. I am a parent advisor at the Peel Center. And a lot of the work that I do is I do help families one-on-one, -on -one, um, helping them navigate the special education system, understanding their rights, the process, the forms, all of, all, of, all of anything that has to do with special education. But the Peel Center does offer an array of services. And this graphic represents six key strategies that we use at Peel to accomplish our work. And as you can see, the families and the youth are in the center of all of our work. And then that is surrounded by the communities and the professionals who work with them. And then the services that are listed there on the side are all the various ways that we do um, help families and um, youth and also professionals as well. So thank you for joining us today. And my co-presenter today, Hi, I'm Michael Storms, and I work for um, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the Collaborative, and I'm a Knowledge Development and Technical Assistance Specialist uh, with NTAC, and I work directly with the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, out of the Cato College of Education. NTAC is a federally funded project, and we were just refunded for another five years, and we support state education and vocational rehabilitation agencies, local education agencies, school districts, and um, OVR in the state of Pennsylvania. We also help to support youth, families, and other secondary transition stakeholders in developing and implementing effective evidence-based practices that help students transition from high school to adult life. And back over to you, Diane. Thank you, Michael. All righty. So today, um, three, of our, three of our key objectives that we're going to um, review is, you know, the first one is discussing what families need to know about putting this topic, transition assessment, into practice and how this actually applies to the IEP. We're also going to discuss the importance of age-appropriate transition assessment during the transition planning process. And then we're also, we will also describe how the topic aligns with the Transition Discoveries Guide, which was developed by collecting voices and experiences from youth, families, and stakeholders, and highlights the key elements that make a successful transition from high school to adult life. This is a collection of indicators and sub-indicators that can be used as a roadmap to guide your transition plan. We will also later in the presentation have um, two guest presenters with us. We have a teacher and a student that will also be emphasizing the importance of the assessment process during transition. Now, some key reminders that we've been trying to go over each time we have one of our uh, sessions here. Transition services must be addressed in the IEP of the student in the year in which the student turns 14 years of age. And that's in the law. That is what happens in the state of Pennsylvania. The IEP team does not have to wait though until the student's approaching that 14th birthday. You can always consider what the student transition needs are even prior to that 14th year. 
And that's through all kinds of conversations and different aspects that we will also give you some, some reminders throughout the presentation here today. Transition planning should also be a coordinated effort where the local educational administrator, the LEA, works with the families and also other relevant agencies. The LEA is critical in helping families to access information to help navigate the resources that will be needed as the student transitions from school to adulthood. And successful family involvement relies on meaningful collaboration with all those stakeholders. So the family and the student, again, are the center of all of that and everybody else is there to assist that family and the student transition. And all of that really starts with a vision. And if many of, some of you who know me um, and, and that I have worked with, and I also talk a lot about this when I talk to the families that call into the Peel Center, you need a vision for your child. You need to be able to know and, and to be able to share with the IEP team you know, what is it that your, your, your child enjoys doing? You know, where do they go um, for the different things that they like to access in the community? You know, what kind of jobs are you thinking about? And then, you know, eventually your child takes that ownership. I am also a parent. I wear the hat of a parent. My son, David, he's also, he's 27 now, but we did a lot of that transition planning even before he was 14. We would have a vision that we wrote and we would share that with the IEP team at every IEP meeting. And that was laying the groundwork and that was setting the stage. You know, my first line was David is going to be, be a tax paying citizen. That sets that stage and that bar that that's where he's going to be. He's going to have a job and all of that. It's important that your IEP team knows those aspirations, your goal setting and the um, hopes and dreams that you have for your child. So our transition uh, uh, process here that we've been uh, recording have been going over eight areas of focus. So this is our third edition, our third month that we're doing this um, for our transition series. Each of the uh, webinars that we're doing, they're all recorded and they are available on our Peel website. We've been doing this in collaboration with NTAC, with Michael, and um, we're, we've been very excited to, to work together and bring you this. You know, I think Michael and I both have lived and breathed and sleep transition. So we hope that each month that we bring you um, a topic that it, it is helping you, um, not just the families and the youth, but all the professionals that are joining us as well. Okay, and with that, we're going to go ahead and go over briefly um, the series that we are involved with. So thanks, Diane. Um, in September, we presented information regarding youth self-determination and self-advocacy. And last month, we discussed the importance of understanding and engaging with outside agencies with the transition process. Today's session, we're going to focus on the importance of understanding and using age-appropriate assessment for transition age students with disabilities. I also wanted to talk a little bit, and Diane just mentioned this, um, in Pennsylvania, um, we have, for the last couple of years, have been looking at utilizing a process called Transition Discoveries and the Transition Quality Empowerment Project, or TQEP. And this is a project led by staff from the George Washington University in collaboration with the Peel Center and the Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Network, or PYLN, through funding provided by the Pennsylvania Developmental Disability Council. And it's designed to work with youth with disabilities, their families, and other stakeholders to enhance secondary transition programming and services that schools are providing uh, to help students successfully transition to adult life. Transitions Discoveries is a program that is being implemented throughout Pennsylvania through the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network, or PATN, and the Intermediate Unit Systems um, to engage and support Pennsylvania's interagency partners and stakeholders. Included in this program is the Transition Discoveries Guide that contains nine secondary transition-related areas that are further broken down into 55 sub-indicators that can be used as a roadmap to guide the student and their family in the transition process. 
the nine secondary transition related areas and sub indicators are presented in this program through definitions, characteristics, outcomes, and meaningful stories told by youth families and transition stakeholders. And all of this information will soon be available on the Transition Discoveries website that's listed there on this slide. And in the next slide, we're going to look at what is available for youth and families and how this information is directly related to today's topic regarding transition assessment. So while Transition Discoveries is in and of itself a type of assessment, this slide outlines specifically the sub-indicator areas that are addressed by transition discoveries and are directly related to transition assessment as it impacts a youth and their family. And these sections include looking at specifically transition planning, helping the youth in their own development and self-determination, looking at this idea of person and family directed planning, and lastly, the section that is included regarding independent living and community engagement skills and activities. So with that, I am now going to turn this back over to Diane, and she's going to focus a bit more on the specifics of assessment and secondary transition and the uh, school systems throughout Pennsylvania. So Diane, back over to you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so now we get into the, the, the meat of the topic here today, which is our transition assessment. And the first thing we want to think about is why do we have to assess? You know, so why do we need to have all these assessments? But without assessments, you cannot plan, you cannot set goals, and you cannot achieve outcomes. When I talk to families and they share concerns, or maybe they are looking for more supports or accommodations, or, you know, navigating the whole transition process is, can be very overwhelming. I say to them, you need data. You know, you need that data in order to plan, in order to set goals and also then achieve them. So data comes from those assessments. So that is why we need assessments to better plan, set goals, and then achieve those outcomes. So what is actual assessment? It's a process of gathering relevant information to plan. You know, the transition assessment process is the method that schools use to determine how a student currently functions in relation to the future working, educational, and independent living environments. The assessment process also helps inform the development of measurable post-secondary goals for a student. If transition is a process of getting from here, where the student is currently, to there, which would be achieving their goals, then transition assessment deals with the here. Transition assessment is intended to include your child's hopes, dreams, and goals from schools, from, oh, I'm sorry, from and goals for the future. Like I talked about earlier with that vision, that is what that is th this assessment, that is where you get the meat of that um, information. Prior to the transition years, some of the information parents have received from schools sometimes can be, you know, negative. Maybe it's, you know, what the student can't do, what your child, you know, um, has deficits in. So a lot of times you might hear a lot of the information about that in previous assessments. But the transition assessment process is an excellent opportunity to focus on what students can do, what assessment process is an excellent opportunity to focus on what the students really can do, what they're interested in, what they want for themselves. So it is more focused on that beginning of the future that you're transitioning out of the school. And you know what, it's okay if a student says, I don't know, I don't know what kind of job I want, you know, all of that. It's okay. Quite frankly, did any of us <laughs> know what we wanted to do at that age either? But it does help re reveal sometimes the needs of what the student needs help with. So if the student does say, I don't know, then maybe an activity for the transition would be further career exploration. So you can take from that and get some type of activity. 
The transition assessment process is a crucial part of the transition planning process because it offers information to help build the transition plan. And that transition assessment helps ensure that the student is working on skills that will help the student identify and meet transition goals for the future. Again, the, the, and, and not again, but this assessment and all the information is found in the evaluation report and also on the IEP under the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Next slide. So some considerations for the assessment process. These are some things, these are just a guide. This is a guide for you to start thinking about, you know, what, do, what about this assessment process, you know? Uh, you need to be thinking about, are there gaps in your transition planning? Now, certainly in the beginning, you probably you might have a lot of gaps because it is the beginning, but it is a good way that every year during the transition process that you're looking at that. And are there any gaps we need to be looking at? And you might need an assessment to, to look into that. Does the youth understand the whys of the assessment? So, you know, as a parent, I would sit down with David before an IEP meeting. We would go over, you know, some of the things that might be occurring, some of the things he might be hearing, you know, so that he can participate as well. Maybe sometimes the teachers have those conversations with the student as well. You have to be thinking about what other stakeholders can assist in the assessing process. Maybe they can identify gaps or, you know, implementing steps to positive outcomes. You know, are the most appropriate assessment tools and activities being used? And we're actually going to be learning a little bit more about that throughout this presentation. How are assessment results integrated into the IEP? And I did just touch on that a little bit where it would be in that present level section of the IEP. But maybe there's going to be a goal that comes out of the assessment. Maybe there's going to be an accommodation. You know, or maybe we're just going to be looking at some type of activity, like I talked about earlier, where if that student says, I don't know, and they, you know, need some type of um, other career exploration activities. And then what are the next steps? You know, next steps, clearly apparent to all stakeholders. You know, this will also be more revealed in our presentation today, too. So that hang tight. Some of the answers you'll get today, hopefully, as we go through our presentation. So. Next slide. Okay, great. Yep, great. Thanks, Diane. Um, so we're next are going to talk a little bit about um, the effective uh, practices around uh, assessment. So really looking at an overview of how assessment should be conceptualized and implemented with secondary transition age students with disabilities. Um, before I do that, though, I did see a question popped up and it was regarding an individual who is, I'm guessing, maybe out of school, is age 21 or, or older, um, and who would conduct this? And the question was asking about um, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, OVR um, definitely could help someone, uh, specifically looking around employment. Um, also, uh, in, your, in, in Pennsylvania, if the individual has an intellectual or developmental disability, um, contacting or connecting with your uh, county-based um, developmental disability, intellectual disabilities office, they could also help with this um, if the student is out of school, is not in, of school age. Um, but it, back to the process, so we did want to present this overview, this effective uh, practices overview of assessment. And it first starts with determining what to assess, and then it involves determining who should be involved in this process, including education and agency staff, family members, and most importantly, engaging that young person, that student in the process. After the who should be engaged in doing assessment is made, a decision occurs regarding selecting the most appropriate assessments based on the student's background, ability, and the determined need for what is going to be assessed. So that first step. After that, that's been done and the assessment's been selected, the assessment is conducted with the student, the results are reviewed and the information gained from the assessment is used to assess the student in moving, assist the student rather, in moving forward with their secondary transition goal planning. In these next slides that are coming up in our presentation, we'll examine each of these six steps in a little bit more detail. 
So when determining what skills and abilities to assess with a transition age student, it's important to take a holistic approach and consider not only the academic skills, so what that student is doing in school regarding reading, writing, math, but also their life skills, uh, their functional skills. So how self-sufficient are they? Uh, looking at finance skills, money management, transportation, um, housekeeping skills, hygiene skills. And then also, though, looking at non-cognitive skills, such as self-determination, um, an individual, a student's persistence on a task, their self-efficacy, and their problem-solving abilities. It's important for teachers and agency staff and families um, who are engaged in the assessment process um, to measure the knowledge as well as an application of the skills in the settings where those different skills are going to be demonstrated. And they may not only look at the student's knowledge and skill ability, but also see how they're able to apply this information to those actual post-school environments uh, for looking at further education and training, employment or community engagement. So it's not simply just looking at academic or functional skills in school, but looking at those next environments and how will that student best function. It's important to remember that assessment should be youth focused and driven. And assessment should help the young person develop an understanding regarding their unique talents and interests, what they want in life now and in the future, what they're currently able to, what they struggle with in their current life and what projected barriers may exist in successfully meeting their post-secondary goals of their engagement and employment in education and community living. And then finally, what their options are regarding school and community activities to best prepare them for what they wanna do currently and in the future. Diane, back over to you. Yes, thank you, Michael. So how can families actually participate in this assessment process? And as you see, there's several questions listed here. And a lot of that kind of focuses on what I talked about earlier was about that vision. You know, really having that vision for your child and you're thinking about what are my child's strengths? You know, what are they interested in? What do they do now? Um, you know, what are they really good at? Uh, and, and then you also need to know what are they struggling at too as well. Transition assessment is a good tool to identify ways to build on existing strengths and find ways to improve in those areas of need. For example, there might be a young person who may have really good mechanical skills, such as understanding how machines work and how to repair them. So the parent might just say at the meeting, you know, my son's really good with mechanical things. And then you go from there and say, well, what assessments will help determine how to capitalize on that talent and find jobs he might excel in? So there you have, you know, something he's really good at. What can we do to help that? What are, what are some other those jobs out there that he might, you know, start to um, gravitate to? Next slide, please. And from that, you need to start from the beginning is determining some of those stakeholders. So you may need to abstain, uh, obtain assessment data from different places, multiple sources. You know, it could be, um, you know, various uh, other agencies that might be involved in that child's life and supporting them to be successful. You know, maybe there's a mental health agency that's involved in the in the child's life you know helping them throughout different things that, that maybe they're having some anxiety or things like that so there might be a mental health provider think about them and having them as part of you know this assessment process having a conversation inviting them to the table and then that's going to help you develop some of these um goals and outcomes it helps you start thinking about what is it that we really need here there might be um there may even be some other people in your child's life that are part of are part of your life, part of the student. You know, like maybe they uh, go to a particular um, library or something every you know every day, or you know they're involving that person. You might need to bring that could be a, a stakeholder that can come to the table that can help you throughout the transition process as well. And you have to remember that I, I want to stress that parent consent is also needed for those outside agencies to work with a student. So if the school is saying to you, you know, uh, we would like to, you know, maybe work with them, uh, get to get, you know, have them come in and be involved, you know, you have to give permission for that. 
Next slide. So assessment data from families, it is real. And what you bring to the table is really important. And it's an ongoing process, okay? It's gathering all the information from the families. And when you think about that young person in the community or any other kind of observations, you wanna think about you know, those outside activities. You know, I kind of talked about the library a few minutes ago. What about sports? Is the child involved in any sports? Are they volunteering anywhere? They could be volunteering and already getting some type of job development skills and so forth. You want to be able to bring those stakeholders and bring that information to the table. You know, all of that information, all of that insight that is brought more to the table will help you build a more uh, meatier assessment, better goals, better outcomes for that student while they're in school, because there might be things that the school can provide to support that student in those outside environments as well. So it's helping prepare, taking those steps year by year until that student actually exits from the school district. Next slide. How can the students participate in this process? This is very critical. It's really important that the student is always part of that process. You know, you know, getting a development, developing an understanding of their disability. And as a parent, I sometimes struggled with that, you know, like why, why does David need to know and understand he has Down syndrome? What does he need to understand about that? You know, things like that. But it is really critical and important because my goal is for him to be a tax paying citizen. So he might need to go to college. He's going to be out in the real world and he's going to have to ask for those accommodations of whatever he might need or, you know, so he needs to know and understand what his needs are. So he may need to understand his disability a lot more. You know, um, some of the things that I did also with for David prior to him taking control was, you know, writing that vision, you know, bringing things to the table. And then when David got to a certain point, I passed the baton to him. You know, this is your future. You need to now take hold of that. So, you know, that your student, your child really needs to know and understand not just their disability, but their strengths, you know, their, their you know, what, uh, what they might need help in. And so they really need to understand all of that. Their voice is very important at the table. And as, and as you're going to hear later on in the presentation, because we're going to have a student also share that experience. Great. Thanks, Diane. I appreciate that uh, going over that section of the importance in engaging different stakeholders in the assessment process. So now that it's been determined what to assess and who will be engaged along with the student in the assessment process, considerations must be made regarding selecting the most appropriate assessment for that individual student. In general, many transition assessments lack depth and meaning, and any one assessment does not provide a comprehensive understanding of the specific uh, content as it relates to how the information will be applied to the various post-secondary settings of education, employment, and community engagement. And even though there are many, many, many assessments out there, selecting the most appropriate assessment to use can sometimes be overwhelming for those folks that are implementing the assessments, be they folks in education or agencies or providers. Determining the appropriate assessment to use with one student or group of students requires the teacher or agency staff um, to consider questions related to each student's specific strengths, interests, needs, and preferences, and to think about which skills each student will need to successfully attain their post-school goals. In general, there are two types of transition assessment, both formal and informal, and we're going to go over both types in the next two slides. So formal assessments. Uh, formal assessments are used for learning about a wide variety of skill levels in various areas, including vocational, academic, or social environments. These are normally commercially published tests, and usually there's a cost for the formal assessments. These assessments are considered norm reference tests, and sometimes you hear that term, and, and basically what norm reference test means is that uh, the test report whether the student taking the test performed better or worse than a hypothetical average student. 
which is determined by comparing scores against the performance results of a statistically selected group of test takers, typically of that same age, grade level, of that student who's already, these folks have already taken the exam. And formal assessments provide a starting point to assist in developing not only the IEP, but the um, IPE that OVR would use, or a supports plan, an ISP that perhaps the intellectual developmental disability supports coordinators might use. And they help to lead in assisting that youth and that family in having a better understanding and developing activities and services for that young person to achieve their post-secondary goals. Informal assessments involve systematically observing the student in various academic, work, and social situations to determine what skills they currently have to be successful in those environments, as well as what skills they need to develop. Informal assessments involve talking to the students, their families, and other stakeholders about what the student likes or dislikes, their strengths, and their areas of need. It also involves setting up experiences for the student to allow them the opportunity to experience something that may be of interest to them, such as looking at different work options uh, in a job shadow or a work experience activity. Informal assessments are often either teacher or agency staff made, and they include such things as interviews, surveys, and task analysis. Uh, and the difference between a formal and an informal assessment is oftentimes with informal assessments, they provide anecdotal information as opposed to that norm referenced or numbered score information data that a formal assessment would provide. Transition and career assessment interests include tools that measure numerous areas related to secondary transition and are helping that student reach their post-secondary goals. And these assessment areas could include and, and include such things as academic achievements, so that's the reading, writing, math um, abilities. Also their functional performance. Um, it also help, looks at self-determination areas, uh, values, interests and preferences of that student, learning styles and preferences, temperance, uh, personality worker styles of that individual students their aptitudes and abilities, as well as skills and <coughs> transferable skills that that student may have. We also wanted to talk a little bit about person-centered planning, or perhaps most accurately, as we call it on this slide, person-driven planning. And that is an ongoing problem-solving process used to help people with disabilities plan for their future. In person-centered or person-driven planning, groups of people focus with that individual student on that student's vision of their life and what they would like to do in the future. Instruction and self-advocacy, including person-centered, person-driven planning, would include activities that build on the student's strengths and interests and help the student feel empowered and to understand that they are an equal partner in the planning of services and supports they need in order to reach their goals and that their opinions are important, valued, and respected and truly lead this process for secondary transition. Example of person-centered planning models and programs include, as we have listed on the slide, charting the life course, making action plans or maps, planning alternative tomorrows with hope or path, using a positive personal profile, or also uh, for students with mental or behavioral health needs, the resilience, empowerment, natural supports, education, and work um, type of person-driven planning tour called Renew. One of the handouts that you have for today's presentation, so if you are looking in your GoToWebinar um, toolbar, you'll notice there are handouts that are listed there. Um, one of those that are listed is a flyer that the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network, or PATN, is uh, presenting a webinar series. And the webinar series is entitled Person-Driven Planning for Life After High School, Meeting the Needs of All. This is a four-part webinar series and provides an excellent overview of person-driven planning 
and how it's being implemented in Pennsylvania. Um, so please check that out. Um, I, at least one of those has already occurred, but there's a couple more that run through the remainder of the 2021 school year. And um, they really are, uh, they're interest, they're informative. Um, if you can't make them on the actual dates that they're listed, um, they are gonna be recorded. They'll be posted to the patent website also. So Nicole, I just wanted uh, to add you, one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add some of those tools that you were just talking about. You know, I just want to let um, our audience know that some of them are time consuming, but the time that you put into that is really critical. You know, my son, you know, he had some complex healthcare needs and, and various uh, needs for his around his disability. And really, we did that planning alternative tomorrows with hopes that path process. And, you know, we did that a couple of times. And, but you know what, with that, you, you invite all those people that are in your child's life and you're getting input from so many different people. And it's such a very natural process, but the information you get really helps drive what that future looks like for your child. So I really encourage um, uh, family members to really look into some of these tools. And they really are perhaps the best. I've oftentimes I'm asked, um, you know, what is the, an assessment for an individual, especially a student with more complex support needs. And I really always do refer back to these person-driven planning tools because they really are the most comprehensive, as Diane was mentioning, um, that they use for her son, David. Um, okay, so moving on um, and kind of looking at um, this continuum in, in this process for effective transition planning. Now that you have selected the assessments to be used, the next step is to actually work with the student in doing the assessment. Um, and it's not as difficult as it sounds. Uh, depending on the student and the assessment, this process can involve a multidisciplinary approach, which basically means obtaining input from multiple sources or people, such as the individual student, their family, another teacher or other educators, um, or perhaps an outside agency staff, employer, or supervisor. It also may involve um, not conducting that assessment all in one day, but rather over multiple days, and could include collecting work samples, observations, or direct assessment with that individual student. Like good teaching, good assessing requires preparation. And it requires being familiar with the assessment interest and having the right materials on hand in order to conduct the assessment. Other Considerations for conducting assessment will depend on the method of the assessment being used. And for some assessments, it'll be important to conduct the assessment in environments that most closely resemble future um, education, employment, or independent living situations. Assessing a student in multiple environments allows for the sampling of skills, utilizing authentic real life cues, prompts, and responses that we really can't replicate if you're doing it in a simulated setting. Preparing to administer an assessment requires forethought relative to recognizing and honoring the student's cultural and linguistic differences, building a good rapport with that student as an effective way to communicate the responses. It may also require uh, different types of accommodations or and or incorporate assistive technology to allow that student to best access the assessments and communicate their responses. This slide is an example that we wanted to provide to you of how the assessment process might be implemented over a multi-year time span with a student regarding the topic of post-secondary employment. This example looks at the activities that student will be engaged in and includes information also regarding who would assist with conducting that uh, assessment and then the actual assessment tools and follow-up use. So for example, in that initial activity of job shadowing, that would involve um, the student, the special education teacher, possibly, possibly a general education teacher, could also involve you know, making those connections with that business in the community. And the assessments that could be used in a job shadowing would be an informal informational interview with the employer, could also encompass a career interest inventory. Um, and then if you look at this, this would be a progression looking then at job tryouts 
And then finally looking at on the job training with supports from a job coach. And as I mentioned, these wouldn't all be done in one uh, school year. This would be done over a course of multiple school years uh, that a young person would engage. And again, the reason for this is to assess their ability and their interest um, around competitive integrated employment. So uh, now that you've selected the assessments to be used and you, um, you're going to actually start to do the assessments with the kid. Um, and um, I'm sorry. Um, and you're going to go ahead and analyze those re results from those assessments that you've done. Um, it's important that after an assessment is given or a series of assessments are given, that the assessment data obtained is carefully analyzed and interpreted to determine appropriate next steps to assist the student in identifying what they want to do in the future regarding further training, employment, and independent living. When analyzing formal standardized assessments, the use of uh, the provided norm tables and ranges allows for that analysis to be pretty cut and dry and straightforward. There's oftentimes well-written instructions on how to score. So for formalized assessments, you know, following the guidance provided in the assessment tool is really helpful. However, informal assessments, such as interest inventories, interviews, and observations, rely on the person administrating the assessment to interpret or make meaning out of the results. However, regardless of whether formal or informal assessments are being used, the goal is to have the data that generates information that can be acted upon when making decisions um, to help that student and their family. Communicating the interpretation of the assessment results to the student, their family, and other IEP members provides an opportunity for the IEP team to discuss how these findings match the experience and perceptions and expectations of that young person. It also provides a form to determine whether additional assessment information is needed and allows um, information regarding what services and activities can be provided. Michael. So the final step. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, there's a question and you might be able to help answer this. What do you know what's included in an ecological analysis or assessment? Sure. An ecological analysis really looks at a variety of different people and situations for a student. Um, so it's really um, more of a composite for that student. Um, so it's looking at how that student functions in different environments, so both in the school and at home and in the community. It involves interviewing all those folks that are involved with that young person. And then it's putting all that information uh, together kind of in a composite uh, report. Uh, how that would impact the student is then that really would look at back if the student is still in school at what measurable annual goals they should work on. So say the student is struggling um, with communication and then how that communication would affect their involvement in further training or employment or living in the community, um, it would guide that. Um, so yeah, an ec ecological assessment, it's a pretty comprehensive assessment that looks at different environments and different people that can contribute information. So, um, anything else, Diane? Any other questions come in? No, so no. far we're good. Yep. Okay, fantastic. All right, so last step. We're in the last step of this assessment process. And this final step in an effective assessment process is to use the informational data obtained to assist the student in successfully reaching their post-secondary goals. Um, assessment data should therefore be used as the basis for developing the present levels of academic and functional performance or the present levels in the IEP. It also helps to uh, that young person figure out what they want to do as far as their post-secondary goals, again, for further education, employment, and living in the community. Um, it helps develop those annual measurable annual IEP goals that I just mentioned. Um, it also helps to determine services and activities the student would be doing as part of their school day, uh, the courses that they're taking, and it also helps to guide the instruction of that student and how they learn best. As we have mentioned, no matter how the assessment data is obtained, it's important to interpret and utilize that information, especially as the basis for the information um, as, as it's provided in the present education levels of the IEP. So in summary, um, for assessment to have value, the information obtained from the assessment must be interpreted and used. 
And this includes sharing that information with other agency staff and providers to include in their plans. Uh, it also includes making sure you're using this information in a portfolio or a transition portfolio as a way of collecting um, and synthesizing that information for that young person. And it's also helpful to use this in the summary of performance. And the summary of performance just quickly is a requirement that as a student is exiting the education system, either aging out at 21 or graduating, a summary of performance that's provided to that young person and their family uh, to help them as they do that final transition into adult life. So um, now we're really excited uh, to introduce you to our spotlight presenters for today. Uh, from the Pittsburgh Public School District, we have Ashley McFall and Shania Jones, who will provide us with information regarding how the assessment process that we just discussed is actually implemented. So Ashley and Shania, over to you. Hello, everyone. Michael, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, wonderful. Um, first, I want to thank you all for allowing us to talk today. I think um, our goal is to really just share some assessment practices that we have in place within the Pittsburgh Public Schools and talk about how we engage in the steps that Michael just ran through in terms of um, being person driven. I like that, you know, person centered, person driven, and how we work with students to really empower them and help them kind of move through their transition process utilizing the assessment data and really um, being part of the process and taking ownership of it because that is one thing that I think you know if we're talking about pitfalls that can happen in terms of kind of challenges and maybe what not to do in terms of assessment we can sometimes see that you know assessments can be done basically almost to just check the box off. You know, this is something we know it needs to happen. We know the results need to end up in the IP. We're short on time. Let's just do it and get it done. When that happens, the students don't really grasp or understand why they're, one, engaging in this assessment. They ultimately then won't be able to utilize the results that, that come out of it. So it's really important that students are involved from the beginning to the end in terms of, um, identifying you know why they're doing this understanding why they're doing this and we really try within pittsburgh public and with the, with our transition staff to really make sure that the students are engaged um, and know what the process is and why this is important and how it can help them drive and define their post-school goals so i um would like to now introduce and hopefully this works we were having some audio issues but introduce shania jones um shania are you here or can you talk hopefully i'm not sure if we're going to be able to hear her unfortunately i'll give her a second but i don't know if you can unmute shania or if we're kind of really just stuck with some tech issues okay um hopefully i'm disappointed i thought it was it was really looking forward to having you hear from shania um yeah she's saying she's just text me she's having difficulties um yeah, so we, shania if it's all right with you unmute her, ashley and i we can't on our end unmute her either so sorry about that yeah i think there's something with the audio connection um but we we already talked and shania said it's all right if i share her um kind of story or kind of her process with um and her experiences with transition and with um transition assessment so Shania has been with the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, she came in early 11th grade, so she was at a different high school prior to that. Currently, she's a senior at Carrick High School and is involved in one of our transition programs called Start on Success. So with that program, she's engaged with um, a teacher in a daily elective course focused around work readiness and transition in general. And she's also participating in a paid work experience in the afternoon. Now, being that we're um, kind of in COVID, we are doing virtual or remote work experiences, but it's, you know, hopefully we can get back into the community because I know um, Diane and Michael have talked a lot about the value of community-based experiences and then the assessment results or, um, and data that you can get out of those experiences. So hopefully we end up there um, towards the end of the year, but um, at this point we're virtual. So she's getting that work experience and she's getting you know, daily classroom instruction embedded into both of those components is assessment. And so, um, she is, um, has done multiple different assessments. You can see here at the bottom of the slide, we've kind of pulled from her past IEPs um, and then currently what, what she's done in terms of an interest inventory. 
um, different things. And you can see here through ninth through 12th grade, she's participated in different interest inventories. And I know we talk about the value of doing different tools and utilizing different methods to gather assessment and, and then over time. So you can see here, based on her different assessments, she's had some different results, but what, what's really interesting is the common themes of both human services and hospitality. So I think with that over time, we can see that, that Shania really does have an interest that kind of validates her expressed interest of becoming a therapist and wanting to help people. Um, and so this kind of, these results validate that because it, it does sustain over time and there is that common thread. So with this data, then Shania can work with her Start on Success teacher um, to kind of really map out what a plan might be to help her achieve this goal of, of wanting to help people. In talking with Shania, she also shared just some like anecdotal information or, you know, stuff, things that we can observe is that she says she loves helping people and that people are, are drawn to her because um, she's a social person. She has strong interpersonal skills. And so people are kind of drawn to her when they need help. And she, she likes that aspect of helping people. Um, and so that's another piece to the puzzle. You know, it's, it's, it's not a formal assessment, but it's, it's, you know, we can observe that. We can see that she enjoys it and that she's good at it. So again, um, that information really helps her. In addition to this kind of interest inventory, she's also participated in self-determination assessment. She did a program at C, or at least started. Fortunately, we had to cut it short last spring because of COVID, but um, a program at Carnegie Mellon University where she was paired up with a college student mentor and there was self-determination assessments and involved in that and helping her assess her decision-making skills. And then the idea with that program would be based on those assessment results, her student mentor could help her work on developing strong decision-making skills, being able to think through alternatives and things like that. So that's kind of where Shania is at this point. She'll continue with this internship throughout the year. We'll continue to assess her with progress, monthly progress reports by her worksite supervisor. Um, you know, hopefully we do get into the community and can do some community based assessments with her to help her identify what skills she has on an actual work setting. Um, if you look here with PA Career Zone, her most recent assessment, um, I really like that tool, especially now because we are working virtually, um, but you can go in there and complete a skills inventory as well as a work importance or values inventory. And that can also help create a, a strong picture that allows then the students to go in and do some direct um, kind of career exploration based on their results. So that's, you know, unfortunately, I wish we could have heard from Shania, but really she's, she has a great plan in place and her, um, we'll talk here, her transition counselor at her high school, which we have one in each high school within the Pittsburgh Public Schools, as well as transition staff, like her Start on Success teacher. Um, we have other comprehensive transition programs in Pittsburgh Public Schools, so um, whether that be City Connections, which is our 18 to 21 year old program, or community-based vocational exploration, which is a community-based um, assessment and career exploration program for students with intellectual disabilities and on the autism spectrum with the support of coaching. Um, within any of these programs that we do have in the district, we embed transition assessments um, in the community, you know, when we're there, in the classroom when, when we are. So um, our staff really understands the importance of transition assessments and um, really finds um, ways to engage the parents in the process. I know Diane was talking about communication is so important. Um, just like the students need to know why they're completing an assessment, the parents should know that that's happening as well and should be involved in the process. They should be asked, tell us about your child, tell us what their interests are, what do you see their plans being when they leave high school? So they should be involved um, as much as possible and communicated to regarding the results. And that leads us to our last point, um, utilizing the data and sharing results. Um, like I said, the students should be almost the ones to, you know, they should be the ones to do that. So they should have an understanding of why they did the assessment, what the results are, and then have the capability to share the results in whatever way that might be. Maybe it's a developed PowerPoint, or maybe, you know, they can, you know, share at their IEP meeting. But being able to do that shows that they really understand um, why they did this assessment and how it can help them. So really, you know, it just all comes back to communication, making sure the students know, communicating with the parents, communicating with the IEP team, 
Um, we talked about outside agencies, making sure they're aware with parent permission of these assessment results so that they can continue to work once a student leaves high school. So um, thank you again for having us. Um, and thank you, Shania. I know you're sitting there and can hear us, but um, I wish you could join in too, maybe next time. Before and you thank leave, you so Ashley. Much okay. yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you might be doing the same thing, Michael. I see there was a question in there, and it might be more specific to you answering this. And it says, um, where would I find the best resource in the Pittsburgh area for a transition transportation assessment? I know that AIU provides that service. Are you aware of private agencies that do this as well? And is, is this something that should be part of the IEP? It definitely should be part of the IEP if, if it's determined a need. So I know, and not knowing where the question came from or where the student or young adult is, but I know with Pittsburgh Public, and I, I meant to mention this as well, we do have a travel instruction team. Um, and based on the IP recommendation, a student referred to that program would go through a travel training assessment. So are they, you know, what are their current abilities to travel as independently as possible in the community? Um, and then working that that team would then work on those skills to help the individual um, as far as and maybe I don't know if anybody else could chime in if there's a private agency yeah. or another agency that can help. Well, um, Michael right I was going to say too. you know if they're a consumer of office vocation rehabilitation OVR they could help you know look at supporting that and I guess it depends on the disability of the student if the student has a blind is blind or visually impaired. Um, there is orientation mobility that a number of agencies offer, um, but I think going through, um, you know, contacting your school, talking to your school staff, um, and seeing what best options exist. And as Ashley said, if there is a definite need for um, that transportation assessment and instruction, that's something that the IEP team should be bringing up and talking about. So, so just to piggyback on what Ashley was saying. Thank you. Um, and actually, again, thank you and thank you, Shania. We appreciate you taking the time to prepare and present today. And sorry, Shania, we didn't get a chance to see you. Technology was yeah. not our friend today. So uh, yeah. thank you guys so much. And um, Diane, yes. I guess back over to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you both very much. Yes, really appreciate your time. Okay, well, one second and there we go. And I see right before I give the reminders, I see there's another question in the box about how can parents make sure the transition goals in the IEP are followed? And how can parents start helping their child work on the transition goals at home? You know, again, talked earlier about the whole communication and being part of the IEP team. So um, how can you ensure the transition goals are, are, are actually being followed? I mean, you should be getting progress. On those goals you know that that is something that the school needs to be providing is that progress and as a parent myself you know i i was oh i was in constant communication with david's transition team while we were in school and you know if i didn't think something was being followed i would bring it to the attention of the teacher and or i would call an, an iep meeting and let's discuss i'm i'm seeing this i'm not seeing this or as a parent you have the right you know you can ask i need help I, how can I do this at home? You know, it's all part of that conversation that you're having to be able to help um, your child at home work on some of those goals as well. It's a team effort and everybody should have that open communication back and forth. Is there anything you wanna add to that, Michael? No, I, I agree. And I think there are, you know, talk again to your uh, folks in your school, your teachers, your transition uh, coordinators, because there's a lot of things that can be done at home. Um, I would also recommend, you know, looking at both the NTAC website, so transitionta.org, um, and we have a lot of uh, resources, especially this year with COVID-19, um, and, and we realize, you know, how, you know, so many students are, and, and you know, your sons and daughters are at home, and they're uh, doing things virtually. Um, I, the reason I'm mentioning all that, we have a lot of examples of things that you can be doing at home. So in a few minutes, we'll show you a slide. Please check out our website because I think there's a lot of resources there. Yeah. 
So I know we only have like a minute or two left. So just some reminders, you know, you know, things are going to change all the time. You know, our lives change as we've noticed um, this past year. So many things have 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 had to, you know, shift here and go there and, and adjust your plans. And so, you know, just just know that this is a process. There is a process and there is a ton of available resources out there. Just ask for help, you know, call the Peel Center, go to NTAC. You know, there are lots of resources out there. You know, here is a few um, that we did put on the slides for you. Um, the methods of evaluation and assessment examples handout. That is your handout in the in the win, in, in the pane of the of the webinar there. Um, person driven planning that also is in there. Michael referred to that earlier. What other? I think uh, yes. So we are rounding off to. Uh, we'll be starting ending this session. But we will see you again in 2021. And our next session will be on January 26th. And that topic is going to be um, here, my, my script post secondary education, employment, and independent living goals. So we're going to really go specific on that IEP in that section and talk about the goals that are there. And I think is that okay? Yes. And here yeah, are we're just kind of wrapping up. So here's just some real quick reminders about NTAC and how you can find us. And we're in social media and our website, transitionta.org. And Diane. And yes, you also have the Peel Center as a resource as well. Please go to our website. Our phone number is there. The um, e email address is there. So if you need any help, you have any questions during transition. I'm here to help you as, as well as my colleagues, but I love transition. So I would love to hear from you if you have any questions or uh, wanna just chat about transition. And we really appreciate you taking the time out today to join us. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you.